This is going to be one of those conversations whereby at the end, if we haven't convinced everyone with an open mind that the monarch butterfly is an absolute death blow to the Darwinian evolution theory and that it is a glimpse into the insight and into the creative genius of our amazing designer and creator, the God of the Bible, then nothing else we say or do is going to work, man. I mean, I will start waving the white flag of surrender, and I'm just going to have to trust that God will have to deal with you in a manner that I am incapable of. Now, I, I don't want to jump the gun, but but how can something that weighs just half a gram, has the brain the size of a pinhead, can fly about 15 miles an hour, how does that travel over 2,500 miles from Canada across the Gulf of Mexico, land in Central America for hibernation? This is an engineering feat that could only be accomplished by a genius designer. Welcome to the Creation Today Show, guys. I'm your host, Eric Hovind, and you are going to be so, so, so glad you tuned into today's conversation. If you're new to the Creation Today Show, Creation Today is on a mission to disciple the world. We want to turn the stumbling blocks that keep people from G seeing Jesus as the creator and the redeemer of mankind and turn those into stepping stones and help people on their journey to know him as Savior. Hey, if you're joining us on Facebook or on YouTube, welcome. I appreciate you guys being here live with us. To our podcast listeners and to our Creation Today television audience, we want to welcome you as well and say thank you for peering into our little Creation Today community uh, for this conversation. If you ever want to join our community, come on over to creationtoday.org. You're welcome to join. I've even got an atheist that's part of our Creation Today community. It's fantastic. Hey, partners, I see you guys on here. Thank you guys so much for being out today with me. Shout out to Lisa and Ron, who went on the Grand Canyon trip with me this last week. It was awesome. I had a great time with you guys. And uh, by the way, to everybody else, um, we're starting our list of people to go on next year's trip. So if you're interested, send me an email, erichovind at creationtoday.org, and I will send you the details on that trip for next June. Uh, truly a, a remarkable trip. All right, guys, uh, you're going to love today's guest. Dr. Thomas Kendall is the founder and the president of Reasons for Faith Ministries. Get this, he was once an ardent evolutionist but he saw the scientific case for creation and is now a zealous creationist. Dr. Kendall has spent the last, uh, more than the last 35 years now lecturing on biblical apologetics and the scientific case for creation. You're gonna love his information and you're gonna love his voice. Dr. Kendall, welcome to the Creation Today Show. Thank you, Eric, it's good to be here. I told you, I love that. I've, I've only been doing this for 24 years, Doc, and uh, not 35. When do I get that voice? When does that kick in? Well, you got to pray and have a lot of faith. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. Oh, my goodness. 35 years now and not always a creationist. How long did that transition take for you? Well, it's actually been over 40 years now, and wow. uh, I actually uh, ended up believing in evolution very strongly at a very young age because I loved dinosaurs. And my childhood ambition was to grow up and be a professional paleontologist and dig up dinosaur bones because I thought, what a cool job, and you even get paid for it. But I uh, later in life, after being thoroughly indoctrinated with my own study, you know, you go to the library as a, as a young kid and you think, well, this great institution of learning, these books wouldn't lie to me. I mean, whatever they say about dinosaurs has got to be the gospel truth, you know? And of course, the school system, the media, the movies, everything in our culture just reinforces the idea that evolution is an unassailable fact. And I believe that and I mocked the Bible and I thought, you know, I wanted to be anything but an evangelical Christian because these people just had blind faith. You know, I'd ask them, what about carbon-14? What about radioisotope dating, the geological column? What about dinosaurs? And they just seemed to have this pat answer. Well, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. And I thought, well, the Muslims have their Quran, and uh, they believe Allah, and that settles it for them. But they believe different things. So how can you all be true? And, and why can't you just give good, good answers to the scientific questions? And so what really bothered me later on, I uh, 
I got challenged by my sister who became a Christian and she began quoting the Bible to me and, they, and it really sounded good. I thought, well, this sounds good. And by that time, I was kind of disillusioned with evolution because I realized if it's true, life has no meaning, life has no purpose, life has no value. You could be the most famous fellow in the world, rich, king of the world. Everybody loved you. But when you die, you lose all of that, even the memory that you ever had it. And you go back into plant fertilizer, and that's the end of you forever because you have no spiritual eternal nature. You're just a product of chance and natural laws, chemistry, and physics. And the universe that created you by chance will shed no tears when you die, could care less whether you existed or not. And so when you die and everyone else dies, nobody will ever remember you ever existed or achieved anything. And the scripture says God has put eternity in our hearts. We know that we know that we know that we are eternal beings, that we're everlasting, that death is not the end. You know, we're going to exist one place or another for eternity. But it really bothered me that evolution being this great fact offered no hope, no value, no purpose, and not even a memory I could hold on to after I died. So I uh, listened to my sister. She eventually got me to go to church with her, and I was having terrible migraine headaches at the time. And uh, she says, come and we'll pray for you. God will show you he's real, you know. And they prayed for me, and I never had another migraine headache in my life. And I was convicted that this was the truth, and I, I gloriously accepted the Lord. I felt called to the ministry. And by the grace of God, I ended up going to a Bible college that actually used the Institute for Creation Research materials in their apologetics course, which is very rare, sad to say. And so I got my questions answered about evolution because I thought, man, I know God is real for the first time in my life. He's healed me. He's changed my life. I can testify to that. But I just hope nobody asked me about evolution because from the time I was knee high, I believed it. And it was so ingrained into me. I just didn't know how to answer. When I found out there were good answers, it changed my whole life. And I started teaching on the side as I was going uh, through college and everything, uh, creation apologetics ministry. Eventually, I went and yeah, got some really advanced training through the Institute for Creation Research. This was like back in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, when they still had their accredited um, uh, graduate school there in Santee, California. Uh, when they moved to Texas later, they lost that accreditation through a court battle and everything. Although they had won, of all things, in liberal California. You know, so that was a miracle there. <laughs> but anyway, I have been involved in uh, teaching in this area of apologetics for over 40 years now. I, I, I look at this and I go, you really did go from one extreme to another extreme, not just a small shift of, oh, I thought, and then, okay, you went from ardent believer, want to be a paleontologist to, oh my goodness, that's not true. God's word is true. Ardent believer, evangelist is what you did. Yeah, well, when I realized how much it had been lied to, it really kind of angered me because with righteous indignation, because I felt all my life, the books, the media, the schools, everybody had lied to me, and they never challenged me to think for myself. They never allowed anyone to play devil's advocate with the theory of evolution, because it really is a house of cards. And when you start picking away at the foundation, it collapses very quickly. But they never even gave me the opportunity. Well, today, uh, I think we're going to pull one more card out of that house of cards. And as we know, when you remove any card, the whole thing comes tumbling down. We're going to talk about monarch butterflies today. And by the way, I got to just throw this out there because this is just, to me, it was such an amazing experience. I've been to Mexico in October during the great migration of the monarchs. And I have oh, wow. seen firsthand the trees literally covered with monarch butterflies it is Amen. a yes it's an incredibly surreal experience well, uh, i envy you i've only seen that on film but i've always oh, i was wondering <laughs> yeah i was yeah. wondering if you'd been there hey by the way shout out to youtube and facebook and to my creation today uh members hey have any of you guys actually been to mexico <laughs> and seen these firsthand somebody out there has to have seen this with me it truly we're not making this up you, you get there and I went, I don't see them. I'm not kidding. I got there and I'm like, I don't see them. And they went, Eric, look at the trees. I'm like, I'm looking at the trees. And they said, those aren't leaves. You can't see the trees. You, I mean, the bark, the everything covered in butterflies. And it takes a second for you to go, oh my goodness. That's yeah. nothing but butterflies. Sometimes you can't see the forest for the trees and sometimes you can't see the trees for the monarchs. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. Wow. Um, so I've gotten to be there. If you've gotten to be there, man, let me know in the comments. I'll be looking at those because um, it really is an amazing experience. Well, mm -hmm. I want to talk about monarchs with you because 
you've got a presentation that really really breaks down for lack of a better word what happens with the monarchs and are they designed and i just i want you to kind of lead us on a journey and teach us here about the monarch butterfly and the design and how it it really it massacres evolution uh, okay. well, and i know you use darwin massacre darwin massacred by a monarch is the title i don't know if you've got a yeah. book out on it but i know you got to talk yeah. out on it like that actually darwinism which is evolutionism of course there you go. That's we should have added that. Make a note, Amanda. Evolutionism. Okay. All right. Take us on this journey. Okay. Let me bring up the uh, PowerPoint here. There we go. Can you see that? All right. I got it. Yes. The case for creation. All right. So Darwinism massacred by a monarch. Of course, Henry VIII was a monarch, and if you uh, got on his bad side, he'd massacre you off with his head. He said that even to his wives off with her head. <laughs> Uh, the potentate that has massacred Darwin's theory is not an earthly king like Henry VIII, but rather this amazing creature, the king of butterflies, the monarch, which is very light and delicate, but it carries tons of evidence that have massacred and crushed Darwin's theory to oblivion. Mm -hmm. Now, here I quote Richard Dawkins, who is perhaps the most ob obnoxious and vociferous evolutionist in the world today. And he said, biology is a study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. Well, maybe if it was, uh, appears to be designed, maybe because it actually was, but being an atheist, he can't accept that. Uh, Francis Crick, part of the uh, Crick-Watson team that got the Nobel uh, Prize for correctly elucidating the double helical structure of DNA. He said, biologists must constantly keep in mind that what they see was not designed, but rather evolved. So we talk about a closed mindedness, you know, creation is not even an option. No matter what you see, evolution has to explain it, even if it can't. Hmm. Now Dawkins again makes an amazing admission. He says, we have seen that living things are too improbable and too beautifully designed, quote unquote, to have come into existence by chance. Well, if it's too complex to have happened by chance, do we need a creator after all? Dawkins would say yes, but he doesn't want a personal creator like Jesus Christ to whom he has to give an account. Jesus said, except you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Jesus said that men shall give an account of every thought, word, and deed of their life to their creator at the end of their life. They don't want that kind of a creator. They want a creator who doesn't hold them accountable. And so Dawkins says the creator he prefers to worship is what he calls the blind watchmaker. Now, I haven't heard of too many blind watchmakers, have you? It's no, that's, it sounds like a tall order right there, or at least I, something I that wouldn't work very well. But he's hearkening back to the uh, the book by William Paley on natural theology, where he argued that if you found a gold pocket watch in the woods, you wouldn't say, oh, I know how this got here. Some pine sap fell out of this here pine tree and chemically reacted with the soil and centuries of solar energy finally got, caused it to become a gold pocket watch. So nobody's ever seen that in the history of the world. You have to have an adequate cause, namely an intelligent watchmaker, to account for that watch, not natural processes. But he wants to account for it by the blind watchmaker, a substitute designer, which he calls natural selection. Now, the problem with the blind watchmaker is that he's not just blind. He's also mindless and unconscious. <laughs> now, blind people can do amazing things. I once saw a concert pianist um, do a beautiful uh, piano concerto, even though he was stone cold blind, because he still had conscious awareness and intelligence, and he could identify the keys by touch. But what if he was also mindless and unconscious? Well, he couldn't do anything. That's too much impairment, and that's the substitute designer they have. He's not just blind. He's mindless, unconscious, incapable of forethought, incapable of figuring out an engineering solution where everything has to happen at the right place, the right time, the right sequence to get the end result. And if anything in that sequence fails, you die. It's extinction. It's as high stakes a game as you can play. Now, DNA is not life in and of itself, but it's a very important component of life. It contains the blueprint instructions for growth, self-maintenance, and reproduction of living creatures. But just getting a, a less than average sized DNA molecule of, say, a thousand nucleotide units, I have conservatively calculated, and is conservative, to be about one chance in 10 to the power of 2,200. Now, they estimate the approximate number of electrons, some say the approximate number of atoms in the observable universe, is only about 10 to the power of 80, number one with 80 zeros. This is the number one with 2,200 zeros. Now, what does that mean in practical purposes? It means there ain't no way, Jose. If, <laughs> if you had the trillions times trillions times trillions of years of time and trillions times trillions times trillions of universes as large as ours, 
and you had reactions taking place uh, a trillion, trillion t- times per second in every atom of the universe, where each atom was replaced by a DNA molecule that would randomly break apart and reassemble, uh, to get the specificity that we need, uh, you wouldn't even put a dent in that number after all those trillions of years with trillions of universes, not even close. And that's just one molecule. You need much, much more than that to get a cell. But what if we did get a cell? Uh, how would we get that cell to go all the way up to, say, an amazing creature like a monarch butterfly? They claim mutation and natural selection. Now, mutation means change over time, but they mean unintelligent, never intelligently guided change, just pure, random, accidental change, because they don't want any intelligent designer to be involved in any way. Otherwise, that means accountability. So to illustrate the problem with random mutations in information systems is that they garble up the information. Uh, Even the evolutionists have used typographical errors as a good analogy to what a random mutation does to the genetic language. Now, this is a sentence many people are familiar with because it's used as a typing drill. It contains all 26 letters of the English language. So you type on your computer processor or old typewriter, as I did in my day, uh, to learn the basic keyboard, the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dogs. So let's see what three mutations will do, random mutations. We get the quick brown aox jumped over the lost eox. Uh, that didn't quite do it. Maybe six mutations will do the trick. We get the Dwight Brazen Aox triumphed over the last Eox. Well, it sounds a little Swedish, perhaps. But I'll give it to you. There is no Swede that can read that because it doesn't make sense in uh, Swedish or English or any other language. And that is the problem. Mutations garble information. They don't make new and better genes that never existed before. They only damage and degrade existing information. Therefore, the natural selector, the supposed substitute creator, cannot select better information because it has a process that won't give it better information to select. That's a terrible lethal dilemma for the evolutionists. I like this analogy of this fellow sitting on his easy chair throwing rocks at his old analog television set. He says, maybe this next rock you know, will, will convert my analog set into a widescreen high definition TV. Well, damaging the old parts will only make worse and worse old parts. It won't produce new and better parts of a new technology that never existed before. You just damage what's already there until it turns into dust. To his credit, Theodosius Stavjansky, the greatest evolutionist of the 20th century, he admitted that this was counterintuitive, or in other words, contrary to common sense. He said an accident, a random change in any delicate mechanism can hardly be expected to improve it. Poking a stick into the machinery of one's watch or one's radio set will seldom make it work better. Well, that's what mutations do. They poke holes in the information and expect it to get better. Not exactly the best uh, means of getting new and better information. You need an author. You need a linguist. You need Exactly. Let, let, me, let me stop right there and go, what would you say to the person who goes, you're misrepresenting mutations because you're you're not. But what would you say to the, the skeptic out there that goes, I don't know if that's really how it works. You're, you're simplifying it too much. It's more complex than that. Well, I would ask them to look at some of the Nobel laureate evolutionist geneticists who use that very same analogy. You know, if they want to, don't want to take it from me, take it from them. And then, tell them, they don't, then tell them they don't know what they're talking about and see how far you get with that. <laughs> okay, so the natural selection deception can be stated thusly. Natural selection has no power to create new and better biological information. Rather, it is wholly at the mercy of random destructive mutations to provide the necessary new information. Since random mutations cannot produce the needed results, natural selection is left helpless with nothing better to select. Notice it's not called the natural creator, it's called the natural selector. So it's not the creator. What does the creation of the new information? Random accidental changes, non-intelligent changes, okay? That's probably a good way that they'd have to accept non-intelligent changes. Where in the history of the world have we seen non-intelligent changes to information result in new and better information? Uh, There is no such example that we know of. So if you can't get better information, it doesn't matter that you have natural selection. It can only select more and more degraded and debilitated information until it turns into gibberish that no longer works. That's why when mutations are large enough to actually see the effect, uh, it results in deformity, disease, sterility, and often death. It's far more likely to kill you or cripple you than it is to help you. But when you get rid of an intelligent designer to write that computer code of DNA, that's what you're left with, hardly a, a worthy substitute designer. Now, why is the monarch considered the king of the butterflies? The monarch, I think there's a number of reasons. <clears throat> number one, it lives longer than any other butterfly. It has a wider distribution over the earth than any other butterfly. 
It migrates further than any other butterfly, as we shall see. And it is the most widely recognized butterfly, at least in North America and possibly in the world since it is so famous. Also, it can navigate over the ocean beyond the sight of land, requiring true navigation capability with a pinhead sized uh, computer to help it. And it grows faster in proportion to its starting weight than any creature in the animal kingdom. And it is adorned with a crown and jewelry that mimics the metallic shine of genuine gold. I think it's appropriate that this metallic gold color that we rarely see in the world of biology has been given by God to the monarch as a crown and as jewelry as perhaps uh, fitting for its royal status. Now, metamorphosis is absolutely an evolutionary enigma. We have insects, which they call very primitive, that basically lay an egg and you have a baby and the baby grows and molts and grows and molts, but it, it remains the same. It doesn't have this radical transformation where you have different structures, different functions, different digestive system, different means of locomotion, everything radically different than what it started with. Uh, if nature is supposedly already solved the reproduction problem without going through this incredibly complex system of metamorphosis, why didn't it just stick with that? You know, the stakes are very high. It's survival or extinction. And why in the world would evolution take something like a caterpillar and say, okay, I'm going to enclose myself in a kind of a tomb or a sarcophagus or a coffin of my own making break down almost all of my internal biological components into a kind of a green organic soup with just basic chemical building blocks, carefully avoiding destroying the vaginal cells that carry the genetic blueprint for all these different structures and functions, because if those get broke down, you're dead, extinction. And then in a, as little as eight days, transforming those basic chemical building blocks into an entirely different creature different eyes with different capabilities, different mouth, different digestive system, different legs, different mode of locomotion, being able to fly and to navigate across thousands of miles, even over the open ocean, hitting islands you've never seen before in an ocean you've never seen before and do this for thousands of years unerringly over and over again. You know, we can't even make any machine that can auto reproduce much less auto reproduce at this lightweight and with these amazing capabilities. We can't even do it in the 21st century. So it starts out as just a little egg. This little egg looks almost like a, a domed cathedral. Uh, several hundred of them can be laid by the female. They're only about four one hundredths of an inch in diameter. And when it hatches out is a tiny little caterpillar about two millimeters in length. It then eats the remnants of its eggshell, which gives it certain uh, nutrition components. Then it starts eating the milkweed, which is the only thing that it can't eat. It can't eat anything else. So the monarch has to know it has to lay its egg on the right type of plant, otherwise it goes extinct. But it starts eating at the center of the leaf, which is much easier to start at the edge where you can get a hold of it with your mouth. But it does that because somebody programmed in its DNA the knowledge that the plant deploys most of its milkweed toxin at the edges of the leaves where most predators and insects try to eat it. There's less at the center. And it's not automatically immune. It has to build up immunity gradually. So it has the instinct, the instinct to start eating toward the center. And then the leaf responds. It detects the damage. And so it moves the milkweed toxin toward the center. But by then, the wisdom programmed into the caterpillar is that it starts eating at the edge. So it keeps ahead of the game. If it didn't, it would overdose on the milkweed toxin. And that would be the end of the line. Extinction right there. Now, it grows and grows and molts and grows and molts and grows until it's up to 3,000 times larger than the tiny little caterpillar that came out of that tiny little egg. And to put this in human perspective, if you had a six pound baby born, that baby would grow in as little as 20 days until it weighed 18,000 pounds, nine pounds in 20 days. So it's the fastest growing in proportion to its starting weight than any creature known in the animal kingdom. Somehow, by a feedback mechanism, it understands it has enough stored chemical energy and nutrition to perform this miracle of metamorphosis. So when it detects that it's ready, it first of all has to have all these things planned out. <coughs> Excuse me. One thing, it has to um, be able to attach itself and hang, because if it falls to the ground, it won't develop, it'll die. So it's got to hang in the right way. But to do that, it has to have something to hang to. So it has super glue, a gland that produces super glue, biological super glue that attaches to silk, has to have a gland to produce that complex silk and attaches that to a twig. And then it clasps onto it with little claspers at its rear end. 
and it hangs in a J shape, which is interesting because J is the, you know, the first letter in the name Jesus, but perhaps honoring its creator, Jesus Christ. <laughs> at least that works in English, right? Yeah, that works in English at least, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, and Jehovah, you know, in, in uh, Hebrew, but whatever. So once you see it hang in that J shape, within 24 hours, it'll do this amazing transformation. And once it starts, it's been documented to, to happen in as little as 60 seconds, although it does usually take a few minutes. Now, <clears throat> here again, it has to split its skin. It has to get rid of that skin. So it splits behind its head and it begins to slough off simultaneously as it grows into this chrysalis. So if we can see what's happening on the inside, all kinds of complex robotic molecular machines are breaking down some and building up others at the same time, according to the direction of the blueprint as to what to do. Again, all this had to be planned out ahead of time. You can't just, well, I hope maybe some mutations will give me the ability to do this. If it's not all pre-programmed, thought out ahead of time, it will not work, and that means extinction. And yet the monarchs have been here, of course, for thousands of years without extinction. Somebody thought it out very well. So as it sloughs off toward the top, we reach a critical problem. Because when that skin falls off, the claspers fall off with it, which means it'll fall to the ground and die. But it has prepared ahead of time, again, pre-thought out engineering, this black post that we see in the bottom right hand corner called the cremaster. It has to be of the right size and configuration. It has to have little hooks on the end like Velcro. It has to stick up blindly because it's shed its eyes, it's blind, it's doing this all in darkness and blindness, and has to stick up the right place at the right time. If it sticks up too late, the skin sloughs off, it hasn't stuck up yet, it falls to the ground and it dies. And it has to be straight up. If it goes to the side and misses that little patch of silk, it dies. Everything has to be just right or it doesn't work at all. Then we have the uh, amazing uh, transformation that takes place in as little as eight days. What survival value is there in you know forming a coffin, breaking yourself down? It's almost like death and decomposition because it's like you've died, you're in a coffin and you're decomposing almost completely. What survival value is there unless you know that you know that you know that already all the engineering systems have been pre-thought out, put there, the vaginal cells have the right genetic code and DNA to produce the right chemical machines to read that blueprint and to change everything and take those basic chemical building blocks and make an entirely different kind of creature with many different organ structures and functions that never existed before. And so it can now be a heavenly creature that can fly. And when it breaks out of its chrysalis, even there, <coughs> excuse me, we have some important things. If the chrysalis didn't have a crease of weakness at the right place, when it tried to break out, it couldn't. So it would die in its own coffin. But it has a crease of weakness in the back. So when it pushes at the front, it'll break out of the back. If that weren't there, it would die. Then it has the instinct to hang on no matter what. It won't allow itself to drop to the ground because if it drops to the ground, the wings won't develop properly. If it can't fly, it can't migrate. If it can't migrate, it can't get out of cold weather and it will die. So it has to hang on there and beat its wings, pump the fluid out of its abdomen to make the wings deploy. And then it waits till they dry out. Then finally, it has the instinct that it's okay to take off. And it can take off on a migration that takes a few generations. Get clear up as high as uh, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick on the eastern seaboard there and then it can fly across the atlantic ocean zigzagging between islands until it finally in this case gets down to guatemala so it is an amazing phenomenon to say the least so the evolutionists have a really big problem here you have to have all this foresight everything thought out done in the right way in the right sequence in the right timing with perfection or it doesn't work but it has to be done by a blind mindless unconscious creator the so-called blind watchmaker which is just ludicrous on the face of it. <laughs> you know, I tell them, you see this ear here? This is not a garbage can. Please don't stick your garbage in my ear. It's disrespectful. If you have something reasonable to say, I'll listen to it. But this is pure malarkey to say this all happened by a blind watchmaker. I mean, we can't even do this ourselves. We can't create a single cell from scratch, even in the 21st century, much less something as complex as the monarch butterfly. In fact, our aeronautical engineers cannot create something as lightweight and as capable as the monarch, even in the 21st century. So, <coughs> excuse me, I'm getting over the tail end of the cold, so I might have to cough now and then. Monarch migration, a navigational nightmare for evolution. Now, Jules H. Poirier is an aerospace navigational engineer, and he was fascinated that the monarch represented a navigating, self-navigating aerial vehicle, so lightweight and so capable that we could not uh, reproduce it in the 21st century with our own technology. 
So he wrote a book about it, From Darkness to Light to Flight, Monarch the Miracle Butterfly. There he points out that he was, uh, gave a challenge to his fellow engineers. He was told by his company, you all have to develop some public speaking skills so that if the media comes in, you'll give a good account of yourself and of the company and be able to talk to them, you know, with, with confidence. So, <coughs> excuse me. Oh. So we had to prevent, uh, present about a 15, 20 minute uh, public uh, lecture to his fellow engineers. So he said, I'm going to challenge them to create a lightweight aerial, aerial self-navigating vehicle that meets the design specifications of the Monarch. Now, I didn't tell them they're trying to emulate the Monarch. He just said, I'm challenging you to make this type of vehicle. And, and this, this is a real story, right? This is a real story. Yeah, you can get the book and read it firsthand. So design and build the following optical lens and electrical navigation system requirements for the lens system. The lens system must be able to see in all directions simultaneously. The lens system must be capable of seeing all the colors of the rainbow and also ultraviolet light and detect the polarization of sunlight. The lens system must detect objects as small as uh, four one hundredths of an inch in diameter to as large as 10 feet from distances of one inch to 20 feet. The light from the lens system must be converted into electrical voltage pulses whose magnitudes shall be proportional to the light intensity, a maximum amplitude or voltage of only uh, so many millivolts delivered to a central computer, be an electrical network system containing no more than 72,000 paths. Uh, the electrical pulses must have a discernible value even when the light intensity is only that of a full moon. The central computer must be capable of translating as many as 72,000 electrical voltage pulses into a meaningful image. Requirements for the navigation system. We see the requirements keep getting harder and harder. Uh, the sensors must be provided to detect the direction of the Earth's magnetic field and the position of the sun. The central computer must be able from an input of information on the sun's position and the Earth's magnetic field to determine its present location to an accuracy of plus or minus 100 feet of its true position. The computer must be capable of directing the navigation pilot, which is an automatic mechanical pilot, uh, to a new location as far away as 3,000 miles or 5,000 kilometers to an accuracy of plus or minus 100 feet. It must also be able to navigate over the ocean beyond the site of land. Other requirements. Now it gets really hard. <laughs> the system must be designed to weigh less than 0.5 grams. Wow. That's, that's less than two one hundredths of an ounce. Okay. <laughs> so we can do things like this. We can't do it this small and this lightweight and have the capabilities the monarch has. The system must be smaller than a P. The system must be designed to be built in eight days by one person in total darkness using mostly basic raw materials and very few prefabricated parts, because that's what the monarch does when it comes out of that chrysalis. That's how it did it. All pre-programmed and engineered ahead of time. Now, the system must have the capability to continually reproduce itself several times per year for at least several thousand years while maintaining sufficient quality control so its navigation equipment can still accomplish the precision mission requirements. And here it becomes light years beyond anything any human engineer can do because we can't make any machine that's self-diagnosing, self-healing, self-maintaining, and especially self-reproducing. Exactly. It does not exist in our technology. This has the fingerprints of God all over it. And God can create something like the monarch, and for thousands of years, its ancestors are here with us today. You know, when we build our, <coughs> excuse me, sophisticated aircraft, like F-22 Raptor, most sophisticated dogfighter stealth aircraft in the world. <coughs> excuse me. Oh, sorry about that. Oh, good. And by the way, I, I still can't believe this guy actually did this and presented this as a, that's, what a great uh, analogy. Yeah. I, 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 I'm like, hopefully you see where, where Dr. Kendall's going with this. It's, it right. should be pretty well, obvious. At the end, you know, he said that his fellow engineers were practically rolling in the aisles. They thought this was the most incredible joke. You, you said, why don't you ask for the moon? There's no engineer in the world can produce a self-navigating lightweight flying system like this. And he says, you're wrong. One does exist. In fact, they exist by the millions and they have existed for thousands of years. It is the monarch butterfly. So those engineers got a good appreciation of the difference between what human engineers can accomplish and what God can accomplish. With men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. But we simply could not do this even in the 21st century. That's amazing. Now, the migratory routes we see cover quite a bit of distance. Most of them travel from uh, south central Mexico up to about uh, the Midwest of the United States. 
the ones that go the longest go clear up to New Brunswick, uh, clear up there uh, in the eastern seaboard. And that's a good uh, 3,000 miles, about 5,000 kilometers. And <clears throat> when they come back, of course, we have to be able to navigate back. They're chasing the milkweed as it's blooming up and up into more northern latitudes. But on the way back, there's a problem. Their lifespan is only about four to six weeks on the average. And they have to fly all the way back from 3,000 miles in that short a time. But even if they made it, they have to overwinter. See, they have to get down south where they're not going to freeze. So if you can't fly, if you can't navigate and get south where you need to overwinter, you're going to die. So it's you know essential for survival. But uh, these actually fly over the Gulf of Mexico. How do they know once they get outside of land that that motion doesn't go on practically forever, you know, like, um, like the Pacific Ocean? They'd run out of fuel, they'd die in the ocean. But they somehow know as if there's a biological map, GPS map, that yes, there is land and they do have enough fuel to make it and that they will make it and they'll overwinter there uh, in central, south central Mexico. But it gets even worse for those that go uh, even further. You know, here we have, as you talked about, that amazing phenomenon down there where the main overwintering ground is in uh, Mexico, where they cover the trees, you know, to where they look like leaves. By painstakingly tracking them through their metamorphosis, tracking, keeping the same serial number, they have proven that when they come back, they don't just come within 100 feet of the tree that their great great grandparents left from, they go to the very same tree. Oh, my. Uh, yeah, so their navigation is actually more precise than our GPS. Now, on this map, uh, satellite map of the Earth, can you see where the Bermuda Islands are? Can anybody, I can. Okay. So it, it, people say, well, I haven't been there. I don't know where they are. Well, the monarchs have never been there before either. They come out of this self-made coffin. They go over an ocean they've never seen before, trying to find islands they've never seen before. They bold, go boldly where no monarch has ever been before, so to speak. <laughs> And yet they know exactly how to compute the correct trajectory to intercept that target. They know where their longitude and latitude is, which you have to know, and you have to know the longitude and latitude of the target on a map. And you have to fight against wind drift, constantly taking ast astronomical observations to keep on course, because wind drift will take you off so much you'll miss it by miles. I was wondering about the wind. I was like, well, would the wind just help take them to the spot? But it's actually blowing them off course constantly. Yes. Yes, it might blow them in the general direction, but you never have a true perfect uh, tailwind. So that, that is a very big problem, especially when you're a little half gram, uh, you know, insect with big wings like sails that can blow you off really badly. Yeah. yeah constant correction. Well, anyway, there's the Bermuda Islands. So they take off there and they go about uh, 1,350 kilometers over the open ocean they've never seen before to hit these islands they've never seen before, but somehow they know they're there. They have a biological map that tells them and navigational capability to reach it. Then they go even further, about 1,500 kilometers, over 900 miles, nonstop to the Bahamas. Then from there, they go down to Cuba, fuel up on nectar. They don't like to stay there too long because their monarchs are made by God, and so they're conservative, and they <laughs> don't like common Cuba that much. So they fuel up on nectar there, and they fly across the ocean to a much better place, Jamaica. Fuel up a little bit more there, and then they fly across the ocean directly to their overwintering grounds near the base of the Yucatan Peninsula in the country of Guatemala. The zigzag pattern shows that they're not just following a basic compass setting going dead south. They know where these islands are and that they have to zigzag to find them. What if they zagged instead of zigged? They'd go out over the ocean, open ocean, <laughs> run out of fuel, and die, and that'd be the end. They'd be extinct. But for thousands of years, they've been doing this navigation feat that most people could not do, even if they had a sextant and clocks and an almanac, you got to know how to use it. Not yeah, the knowledge has to be yeah. there ahead of time because, exactly. wow. You have to have everything. That's why it's so irreducibly complex. You know, any one component is missing, it doesn't work. So what are the secrets of the monarch's navigation capabilities? <laughs> well, they found that they use the sun during clear weather, which is a bit uh, challenging because the sun appears to change position as the Earth orbit uh, rotates on its axis. And so the sun is at different positions, different times of day. Its little pinhead uh, computer compensates for that automatically. What if it's obscured by clouds? Well, as long as there's a little window of blue sky, it can use its amazing eyes by detecting the polarization of sunlight to determine where the sun actually is. It also has essentially the equivalent of a kind of a sextant, these little slits in its antennae that can detect by the angle of the sun's uh, reflection how high it is above the horizon, just like a sextant determines how high above the horizon the sun is. And if you happen to have a calendar, so you know what day it is, 
and you have this information, the sun rose at this azimuth on the horizon that got this high and no higher, you look that up in your navigator's almanac, because that will then tell you something. Once you look up the data, this is the data. What does it mean? And that navigator's almanac says, well, this means you are at this latitude. But you also need to know where your longitude is. You have to both know latitude and longitude. And one of the best ways uh, to do that is having accurate clocks. And this was a big problem in the days of sail ships back in the 1700s, 1800s. Back in those days, you know, they had pendulum clocks, like a grandfather clock. You put that on a rocking ship at sea, it will not keep time. Yeah. So they invent the spiral uh, spring watch or marine chronometer that was impervious to the rocking and rolling of the ship. And then if you have an accurate clock that tells you the local time where you are, you compare that to the time at zero longitude or the standard meridian called Zulu time in uh, the military or universal time usually, or Greenwich Mean Time because it goes right through Greenwich, England. So you compare the time between these two clocks. They have to have the biological equivalent of two clocks. You subtract to find the difference in minutes. Then you divide by a certain number and that will give you your longitude. Well, guess what? Even if you have those clocks, do you know what number to divide by? If you don't, you're gonna die at sea, you know, but all this is done automatically by that pinhead sized computer in this amazing flying uh, creature that has been doing this for thousands of years. You know, it's just absolutely astonishing. It is. What if it's cloudy or foggy and you can't see the sun at all? Well, it has a magnetic compass to help us through that time. But all of this is worthless unless you have something else. What's that? You have to have the equivalent of a biological map of the earth because you have to be able to determine with an accurate map where your longitude and latitude is and where the longitude and latitude of your target island is. What if you have a map that was put together by blind mutations, not that it could make a map at all, but say it could, what's the chance that there might be an error? And they say the islands are located in the wrong place. So you compute correctly the longitude and latitude with all these mechanisms. You go to where the island's supposed to be and it's open ocean and you die because there's no place to land. Wow. Because your map was put together by a bunch of blind, random, destructive mutations. I mean, it's absurd. You have to have all these things working with precision or you die. Pretty high stakes. And I don't think the monarch would be surviving to this day unless a master inventor, creator, and designer put it together. So to put it in perspective, we can ask the question, how well could you navigate if you were treated like a monarch? Say they stick you in a coffin and ship you up somewhere on the northern eastern seaboard and you realize, oh, I can fly, but you got to try to hit those islands that you've never seen before over an ocean you've never seen. And you only have the most basic knowledge. You're somewhere in North America, but you don't know exactly. Well, you say, well, I remember in Boy Scouts that sun rises in the east, sets in the west. And I know how to locate off the rim of the Big Dipper Polaris to go to north at night. And I kept a uh, magnetic compass out of my Cracker Jacks box last time I had Cracker Jacks. And so, boy, even if it's cloudy, I can determine north, south, east, and west. You get ready to take off and it dawns on you. I have no idea what my longitude and latitude actually is, nor the longitude and latitude of the target island. If I'm not precise, if I miss it by just several miles, I might not even see it from the air and I'll die. So you have to be able to determine your longitude and latitude where you really are in North America to know the correct uh, line of trajectory to intercept the target. You have to know your map is accurate and where it says you that the islands actually exist because you haven't seen it before. Only the map is telling you that they even exist and that it's having them at the right place, not the wrong place. Otherwise, you run everything, all the computations, but you end up in the wrong place and there is no island there and you die. I mean, when you think about it, it's just incredible. All this irreducible complexity had to be there in that little egg that's only four one hundredths of an inch in diameter. It's all pre-programmed in there. It's been working fantastically for thousands of years. That, like that. that is truly mind blowing to go not only from the egg to growing in size, the number of times it grows in size to the product that it eats to the to the being able to create a, a shield around itself to, to basically go back down to the basic components in order to emerge as a butterfly to to stay there on the chrysalis and not drop down and become a butter crawl uh to 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 then fly and migrate depending on what generation you are up to canada and then that great generation back down yeah that's and another then, point that i should have mentioned is when they get way up there in the far north uh that has to have an extended lifespan now the normal lifespan in the previous generations is only about four to six weeks about five weeks on the average one has to fly all that way and over winter, it must have a much longer lifespan or it'll, even if it gets down there, it'll just die of old age, right? So that fourth generation, which is called the Methuselah generation, 
it's programmed to kick in longevity and it will last not just uh, four to six weeks. It will last minimum of about eight months to up to a year, giving it plenty of time to fly all the way back down there and to overwinter for several months and then have enough energy and lifespan to fly back up and lay its eggs to start the whole cycle again. So if you didn't get that Methuselah generation kicking in at the right time, it's all for nothing. You die anyway. It all has to be there simultaneously. It's all or nothing. So here wow. it is, as as you can get. Gary says, dare I say, shouldn't this one amazing critter be enough to rock the world of any evolutionist? And that's kind of what I said at the beginning, Gary. I was like, I, I don't yeah, understand. It, it, it's kind how. of ironic. I, I find over and over in studying this, the evolutionists use the word miraculous when they talk about the metamorphic <laughs> transformation and capabilities. They don't believe in a miracle worker, but they can't refrain from using the word miraculous. That seems mm -hmm. kind of incongruous to me. If you're going to believe it's miraculous, then there has to be an adequate cause, which would be a miracle worker. Wow. Hey, Gary was also wondering, we used to see a lot of monarchs in the Western, in Western Iowa. Did these monarchs take the same migration route path that we're laying out or what's going on with the, um, the population? I've read that it's, it's been in decline. Yes. Uh, do you, wh yeah, where's it, that it, at? Both, uh, both the bees and the monarchs have been suffering a pretty much almost catastrophic decline of their numbers. Uh, some people think it's, uh, you know, uh, cell towers. Some people think it's uh, certain uh, insecticides that have been used that have, haven't been properly tested. Whatever it is, uh, there has been a big die-off. The monarchs used to uh, be about 300 million strong as they migrated. And on their wow. migratory paths, they'd fly over in huge clouds that would temporarily block out the sun, just like a regular cloud. Uh, but you just don't see them in that great numbers anymore. They've been reduced by about 90%. In other words, instead of 300 million, we're only getting about 30 million migrating nowadays. I remember when I was a kid, they were all over the place. You know, you'd find them, put them in a jar, have them at home, have them at school, watch them metamorphosis and everything. It was fun. And now you can't hardly find them at all. So it's tragic that there has been such a decline. And I hope they don't go to extinction, whatever is causing this problem. Man. Hey, also, I remember wondering the name of the book where the um, uh, engineer put forth that uh, challenge to his engineering uh, field. Yeah, it was a Jules H. Poirier, and it's From Darkness to Light to Flight, the story of the monarch butterfly. And I'm not sure if you check the various creationist websites, uh, Answers in Genesis, ICR.org, uh, creation.com. One of them would likely have it, I'm sure, because it's an excellent book, and I'm sure somebody still has it in stock. Okay. PK wonders, hey, won't evolutionists just see this as natural selection and passing? It's information that was passed down through the DNA, so eventually as they made it, somehow the information was in the DNA. I guess that, that gets back to, you know, well, what would... To, to say it's just somehow there is not a scientific explanation, is it? You have to explain how it originated, and that's the whole crux of the dilemma. Uh, where in the history of the world have we seen complex information, whether it be uh, computer codes or written information or DNA, arise by time, chance, natural laws, chemistry, and physics? Exclusively in our scientific experience, we never see two things arise except by intelligent design. One is language, and the other is machines. And we now know at the molecular level, something Darwin had no inkling of, that it takes complex genetic information, which codes for molecular machines, that are able to read that information, understand the blueprint, and build up all these complex apparatuses that make life work, and they're interdependent in themselves because DNA cannot be replicated without the protein machines, yet the structure and blueprint for the protein machines is carried within DNA. It's like the chicken and the egg. You can't have one without the other. So it's not like, well, we'll evolve DNA and then later we get proteins. No, they have to evolve simultaneously, interdependently, and you can't even get one by chance. I mean, where, where's the proof? I mean, it's like the old uh, saying from the 80s, where's the beef? You know, <laughs> they have to show that we can get complex information by chance and natural laws, chemistry and physics. They've never been able to do that. We can demonstrate any day of the week, any laboratory in the week, that intelligent design can work every time in producing complex information systems. Intelligent design works every time in producing complex machines. Where's the proof it ha happens any other way? It's simply not there. And so either put up or shut up. In science, you have to prove by experiment that what you're saying is true. You can have all these ethereal theories, but where's the practical application where we actually see it happening or can prove in a laboratory that it happens? I know Dawkins and others have done these, uh, you know, computer simulations where all oh, you know, the shows, you know, like we got uh, this phrase out of uh, Shakespeare's Hamlet, you know, methinks it is like a weasel. 
Well, when you look at it, he intelligently programmed the artificial intelligence of the computer. So as the alphabet letters are thrown up on the screen, the computer thinks with its artificial intelligence, I want this letter at this space, nothing else. I reject all the others because I intelligently know that's what I need to make this sentence out of Shakespeare. And so it was a targeted, intelligently designed result. What I challenge them is pour a bunch of bird seed on the computer word processor keyboard, open the door or the windows, let birds come in and peck around and walk on those keys and see how long it'll take you to get some meaningful information. Mathematics it wouldn't be done even in billions times billions of years. So that shows right there that when you don't use man's intelligence artificially programming a computer, then you just don't get it. It always leads back to intelligence when it comes to information. And back to the miracle of the butterfly from darkness to flight, uh, to, to light to flight. Even if we could, when you take you know the, the example that he gave and said, here's what I want you guys to engineer and develop. Even if we could develop that, that would still prove the point, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah, all it would show is that it takes extreme high technology and intelligence to make it work. So that would reinforce the fact that it only happens by intelligence, something we already know. You don't get information systems, you don't get complex machines except by intelligent design. It does not happen any other way. They can believe it. It's a fantasy, a fairy tale, but they can't prove it scientifically. Hmm. So, um, Paul, I don't know if you're talking to us in the chat, but he said, I'm, I'm confused. The products of evolution need not be aware of the process of evolution. So um, I'd agree. I, I don't know how God made a cow, but I give credit to the designer God who made the cow rather than giving credit to like nothing designing it. So I'm, I don't think... Uh, well, in the monarch, we see one of the more extreme examples of intelligent engineering design and forethought having to go into the end product. You have to think ahead. At this stage, I need this. At this stage, I need that. At this stage, I need this. And I have to have it in the right sequence, and I have to have it in the right timing. Because if any one of these features fails, the end product fails, and that means extinction. And that's the end of the species. They should not exist anymore. But the blind watchmaker is blind, mindless, and unconscious. So he has no sight to see. He has no mind to reason with. He has no consciousness to be even aware of anything. And all I can do is select more and more degraded information by random errors in the DNA. I mean, it's just ludicrous. You know, like I say, it's insulting to our intelligence. We don't have to put up with this. You know, put Paul is wondering. Sorry, Paul is wondering if you keep up with monarch butterfly evolution research in peer-reviewed scientific journals, and uh, says uh, Dr. D. A. Green in 2021, A. M. Young, eight, uh, 1982, uh, and then another one in 2001, 2019. Um, they propose naturalistic mechanisms and um, introduce reducible complexity. Uh, if so, have you had uh, a chance to look at it's that? Just, and that it's just, yeah, it's just more storytelling. I've seen it, but again, you have to be able to prove this in the real world of science, real experiments that show this. All those mechanisms that he's talking about that are irreducibly complex are ultimately traced back to information. Tell me where the information originated. How did that happen? And can you demonstrate in a realistic experiment in the laboratory how that happens? They have never done that. And that's the key question. Until they answer that question, they haven't earned the right to talk about anything else. It's nothing but speculation. It's nothing but blind belief. Let's have the demonstration. Like I say, we can demonstrate any laboratory, anytime with real experiments, repeated experimental observation. Intelligence will produce complex information every time. It'll produce complex machines every time. Where is the precedent that it can happen any other way? I mean, they talk about it, but talk is cheap. Demonstrate in a laboratory where we can really see it in the real world. And that they cannot answer. They say, oh, well, we have proposals. It's like with the origin of life. They failed miserably for decade upon decade upon decade. Now I notice they don't even like to talk about experiments anymore. They say, well, we have all these theories and all these scientists agree that these are good theories. Well, why don't you put the theories to the test in the laboratory? Well, they shy away from that because every time they've actually done that, their so good theory turns out not to work when you put it in the real field of experimental science. And so they say, well, we have so many theories and, and all the majority agree that these are good. One of them must be true. Those are logical fallacies right there. For one thing, science isn't based on majority opinion. In fact, when you say, well, the majority believes something, therefore it must be true. That's a textbook fallacy of logic called argumentum ad populum, an argument addressed to the population or the majority. So if the majority believes something is true, therefore it must be true. I mean, a child could see the, the illogic in that. Many times the majority has been dead wrong through history, even in the history of science. They've been dead wrong. 
And well, the majority of those with credentials agree. Well, that's a logical fallacy too. It's the argument of ad authoritarian fallacy or more commonly known as the fallacy based on an appeal to authority. The problem with all authorities and scientists is that they're human. They have pride, prejudice, preconceived ideas. They have the human frailties of you know, wanting to believe something even if it isn't that true and having ulterior motives perhaps for wanting to believe something. And just because they all agree on something, that doesn't make it's true. It doesn't mean they, if they're human, they can be fallible. All humans are fallible. Just because they have the majority doesn't logically prove they're true. Just because they have great credentials doesn't prove that they're true. Why don't they just demonstrate, like I challenge, show me consistently, repeatedly, experimentally that we can get complex information every time by nothing but time, chance, and random processes of chemistry and physics. And by the way, can we get any complicated machines? The simplest machines of nature are proteins. Those are enormously more complex than most of the machines we have in our technology. Nobody would ever hear that a supercomputer happened by a bunch of blind random accidents without anybody producing computer code, without any engineers putting that together. But something much more complex, the first cell, they believe that happened because the majority says so and we have the credentials. It's a ludicrous argument on the face of it. It is illogical. I think the slide that you have up now kind of helps demonstrate once again, here's what we can, quote, prove. Here's what we've actually got compared to, here's what we've been able to accomplish. Uh, here, here they're trying to make an insect size flying material, a uh, flying vehicle. And you notice it took intelligent design. This was at Harvard University. I think it took close to a million dollars. This was a number of years ago. Uh, and the best they could get this thing to do was to hover without crashing, and they could make it veer left and veer right on command. But you notice they had to cheat. Notice there's thin little copper wires on the left side at the bottom there. That's because there's an off-board electrical power source, okay? <clears throat> if they had to put a battery on the thing, it probably wouldn't be able to take off. You see, they, they talk about in the military, yes, we're going to invent little flies that are drones that fly in the window like a fly on the wall and listen to the enemy and come back with the intelligence. That's all science fiction right now. We don't have the technology to invent batteries small enough and light enough to give it enough energy to fly hardly at all. In fact, they follow up to this was called the Robo B, which is even bigger. And they couldn't, you know, they said, we want to get it untethered from an external power source, an external electrical power source. So we'll do it with solar energy. We'll give it a solar panel, lightweight solar panel. But even then they couldn't get it to work because the panel would have to be so big and have so much aerodynamic drag that it wouldn't work in regular sunlight. So to make it small enough where it could actually work where the thing could fly up and hover just a little bit before it crashed, they had to put it in a room because sunlight wasn't good enough. They had to use high intensity lamps, much brighter than the sun, just to get the thing to take off and hover a little bit. And usually it would crash after a few seconds. That's as far as they've got. The Monarch demonstrated flak can fly over 900 miles with unerring navigation capability and hit those Bahama Islands. You know, that's, that's something we cannot do. We're not even close to doing that with our technology. But when they look at the Harvard robotic flyer or the robo bee, they say, oh, aren't we amazing? We'll pat ourselves on the back. We're such good engineers. We can't even make anything like the Monarch. They say, well, that happened by chance. And the majority says so. And the people with credentials say so, therefore it's so. It's a logical fallacy. I'm not swallowing it. Don't put your garbage in my ear. Yeah. Let alone replicate itself, create a chrysalis, you know, oh, straight jacket, straight jacket for straight itself, jacket. tie it up in, his, in a straight jacket. These people are great at storytelling. I tell them, prove it in the real world of science, or I don't want to hear it. I don't care. Break about down else. all those elements that make the wings and the, the little body and the actual mechanism to fly, break those down into their simplest yeah. components and rebuild. Wow. I mean, just you look at the monarch butterfly and you go, it really does massacre evolution. There's no... Well, for those who are willing to reasonably listen, but those who are determined to believe the lie because they have a vested interest in not wanting to be accountable to God. I mean, there's nothing new under the sun. We see this in the days of Jesus Christ. Jesus performed one of the signature miracles of his deity when he raised Lazarus from the dead. Okay, he deliberately waited four days. So that they couldn't say, oh, he passed out, you know, and he's just in a coma. No, he was stinky dead. You know, they objected, oh my gosh, he's going to stink like crazy. And I'm sure when they rolled back the stone, everybody going, ooh, horrible stench of death. So when you're stinky dead, you're really dead. You're not just in a coma. So he deliberately waited until he was stinking, rotting, putrefying, you know, corrupting back into dust. But he basically was making the claim, I am the same God who took a lump of dust back in Genesis 
and breathed into it the breath of life and made that lump of dust a human being. Now, Lazarus here, he's rotting back into dust, but he's not as far gone as Adam was when I started with him. But because I'm that same creator, I can take this dead, rotting, stinking, putrefying corpse and make all those trillions of cells perfect again and bring the spirit back into the body and make him live perfectly again because I am the author of biological architecture. I am the creator. And when he raised Lazarus, it was such a profound miracle that the chief priests, the elders, the Pharisees were so angry because it said so many people were believing on Jesus because of this miracle of Lazarus. Well, of course, I would do if you saw something like that. But, but instead of saying, well, the evidence is there, we can't deny it, he must be the Messiah. He's fulfilled the prophecies. He's done miracles that only the creator can do. He must be the son of God, like he claims. But instead of doing that, what does it say they did? They conspired as to how they might murder Lazarus to get rid of the evidence. And I suppose they intended to bury him like Jimmy Hoffa, someplace where nobody would ever find him, because if Jesus found him, he could raise him again. But that was, you know, their perversity of their rejection of the truth. It doesn't matter. People saw Jesus do miracles right in front of their eyes, and they still rejected it and said, no, it's, it's done by the miraculous power of Satan. We will not believe it's from God, because man has free will, and no amount of evidence will convince him against his will. This is for people who have honesty and who will look at things honestly and logically and say, okay, I want to submit to truth. But those who don't want to submit to truth simply don't have to. God gave them a free will. Man, Gary says this is so fun. Patricia wants to know, hey, where does the monarch get its energy? And I, I think the same thing. I mean, this this Methuselah generation that's able to to do these feats, it's like, where's the battery on that thing? Uh, right. Well, it has a much more efficient system than the battery. It has a complex uh, biological metabolic system. And metabolism is the means by which through digestive processes, you harness chemical energy that can then be converted into mechanical energy, making muscles work. And of course you have to have you know, all these things that the, the caterpillar did not have. Caterpillar didn't have wings, didn't have muscles for wings. It didn't have the same type of metabolism because now the monarch has this long uh, spiral uh, proboscis, you know, like a long tube that it extends to suck nectar, which of course has high energy in it being sugar. And so it gets plenty of energy from that, but it has to have a different, entirely different type of metabolical system to digest that and derive the energy from it. And it, that system is more complex than any energy generation mechanism we have in our technology. So that's yeah, why it's so amazingly efficient. If we figured that out, we could we could run the world's electricity no problem. Sorry, I'm bumping the mic here. We could yeah. we could run everything no problem if we actually figured out how to do what our bodies do and what this monarch butterfly can do. Right, right. And uh, the reason we haven't, because we're not God. <laughs> I got a little mosquito. We got to do one on. The, I got a little mosquito flying around me here. So I'm like swatting at it. I, every time I swat a mosquito here, I'm going, there's a lot of information right there. That's pretty incredible. I mean, yeah, I, I right. hate to say to the, it, but incredibly designed. Oh, yeah. They, they may be nuisances. Flies and mosquitoes are nuisances. But when you think about them, they're masterpieces of aeronautical engineering. And we simply cannot to this day in the 21st century, make something that small and that lightweight that can fly and navigate the way those things can. And do you think Do you think God gave us the monarch just to help us recognize um, what he's asking us to do? The, the I think that there's a couple of reasons. We'll get to that dancing here. Uh, why did God make the monarch butterfly? Oh. One of the reasons is to teach us God's attributes, as it says in Job chapter 12, but now ask the beasts and they will tell you and the birds of the air and they will tell you and the fish of the sea will explain to you who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this. You know, if God would give these creatures a voice like he did to Balaam's donkey, where they could actually talk, they wouldn't say, oh, praise Darwin, praise the divine watchmaker of evolution. They'd say, praise the Lord, our creator. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. And of course, the creatures most fearfully and wonderfully made are mankind. We're made in the very image of God. But that's why it says in Romans 1.20, this is something evolutionists have to chew on. If you want to get rid of the creator, you have to explain the creation without the creator in a reasonable way, not just we have the majority on our side and we have credentials. That's an illogical argument on both counts. Give us real science. So it says, for ever since the creation of the world, his invisible nature and attributes, that is his eternal power and divinity, have been made intelligible and clearly discernible in and through the things that have been made. His handiworks. Today we've looked at just one of his marvelous hand, handiworks, the monarch butterfly. So men are without excuse, altogether without any defense or justification. 
That's the challenge God poses to the evolutionists, and they have failed miserably to answer this clear-cut challenge. Now, the other reason I believe God made the monarch butterfly is to give us a beautiful illustration of his power to cause miraculous transformation from both spiritual death and physical death to life everlasting. As it says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, if ever there was a, a type and shadow of a transformation from old to new, it's with the metamorphic cycle of the monarch. Here you have this poisonous worm bound to the earth, and yet it is able to transform by what they even call a miraculous process into a heavenly creature that can now fly and navigate over an entire ocean and, you know, travel thousands of miles unerringly. Uh, it's a total transformation and uh, is a type and shadow of what God does for us in transforming us. So uh, man is said here in Job to be just, uh, you know, a maggot and a worm. And that's even though we're made in the image of God, we are so marred by the effect of sin and the fall of man into sin. But in Psalm 22, which is describing Christ on the cross in the spirit of prophecy by the, by the prophet King David, uh, Jesus not only said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But later in Psalm 22, at verse 6a, it says, but I am a worm and not a man. And when you think about it, it's like this, this worm or this caterpillar, it eats poison and becomes poisonous. And it's, it's a vile creature. It's not a really beautiful creature like a monarch butterfly is. But Jesus became human. He lowered himself, humbled himself, become man, even though he is God and, and remain God, both God and man. But he partook of the poison of our sin, like a vile worm squirming in the poison of human sin, ingesting it and actually becoming sin. The scripture says, he who knew no sin was made to be sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So here we have this type and shadow of this poisonous worm. And yet, you know, the monarch eats that, that uh, milkweed toxin actually to defend itself. It, it gives itself defense from predators because if any predator eats a, a monarch caterpillar or even in its adult stage as a butterfly, it retains that toxin. Anything eats it gets sick, vomits it out, and says, man, I'm never going to eat one of those again. So it's a deterrence. It helps detour predators. But Jesus became the lowest of the low, a vile worm. He ingested the toxin of human sin, not to protect himself from predators, to, but to protect us forever from predation by sin and by Satan. And because he did that, he tasted of death for us. We can have that marvelous, miraculous transformation forever in a new body. We will inherit a new heaven and new earth where righteousness dwells. No more sorrow, no more sickness, no more pain, no more tears, no more curse, no more death for the former things are passed away. As it says in Philippians 3, 21, that he shall take this vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. So the God who can do this miracle for the monarch butterfly can do it for us. Every spring and summer, we see this type and shadow of transformation from a vile poisonous worm to a beautiful heavenly monarch. And that's ultimately our destiny. Although we're lost in sin, poisoned with sin, earthbound, incapable of having a heavenly fellowship, God can transform us through his death and resurrection, the power of the gospel. He can give us that new body and that new spiritual everlasting life. And I think that's one of the main reasons God put that there for two. One, it's so complex that the evolutionists cannot explain it reasonably. And number two, it is this beautiful type and shadow of the power of God to bring miraculous transformation. And when he does it for us, it's much more meaningful and the effects are, thank God, everlasting. And it truly is beautiful in the end, you, whether it's the butterfly or the beautiful salvation that he offers you and I, guys, it truly is beautiful. Hey, if you've never learned or never studied how to be saved from your own sin, I just want to encourage you, go to creationtoday.org under the about or the learn button. I forget what it says now, but go click on how to be saved. And it's just the gospel message. I'd, I'd love you to do that. I also, I had a conversation with David Fine. He's a butterfly expert in Flor Lauderdale, Florida, who has a personal collection. Get this, Dr. Kendall, a personal collection of more than 35,000 butterflies. Uh, it's amazing. Oh. You gotta, you gotta watch this conversation I had with him. It was truly amazing. We're just making that available to anybody uh, at creationtoday.org slash butterfly, creationtoday.org slash butterfly. Uh, and you, you just, his insights again, just like yours, just make you sit back and go, wow, God is an amazing designer. He truly is. 
Amen. Amen. Well, Dr. Kendall, thank you for taking time with us today to walk us through this process. It's it's enlightening. It's engaging. It's powerful. It is uh, challenging. Uh, I, I hope that I hope that we take this and not only share this with other friends and family that we have or that we get to talk with, but take it and use it to bring glory to the Creator who made it all in the first place. Amen. So, Amen. Dr. 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 Kendall, thank you for for using your life this way and for spending the last forty years educating others on these topics. If if people want to get a hold of more of your research or more of what you've done, what's a good place for them to go to get that? Uh, they could go to my website at uh, kindle.nwcreation.org, or they can simply uh, type in my name, Dr. Thomas Kendall, on uh, a YouTube search, and that, that'll bring up my website as well. They can't actually order any of the 33-plus DVDs that I have, including a DVD on the Monarch that I just did. Uh, but if you call my phone number, which is on that site, uh, you can order with a Visa or MasterCard over the phone, and I do have a lot of DVDs available that way. Man, I, I I need to get your just. I just love listening to your voice. Your voice. You just not only do you have the intellect, not only do you have the the logic. You've got the presenter's voice. I just wow, what a blessing. God gifted me, and I'm I'm glad I can use it for His glory. Amen. Well, we're glad you're using it. Hey, and that's a challenge to everybody else out there. I mean, there's more people out there that could be out there presenting. You don't have to have a great voice. I'm want to tell you that. You just take the little bit of knowledge that God has given you and start sharing it with others. Share it with your, your church youth group. Share it with your Sunday school class. But let's get busy talking Amen. about the glory of God with the world. Amen. I agree. Hey, next week, I am looking forward to a fantastic conversation. I'm going to be talking to Ken Ham, and I want to challenge him. I want to go, hey, listen, his ministry is called Answers in Genesis. I want to go, okay, are all the answers really in Genesis. Is that really where they're all at? So we're going to be putting some challenges to Ken Ham next week. I hope you'll join me Wednesday at noon. Uh, if YouTube and Facebook, if you guys didn't kick them off, hope you enjoyed it. We just left you on here for the whole show today because it's so good. It's such good information. We just wanted you to enjoy the whole process with us. Uh, if you want to join us, typically the whole conversation isn't on YouTube and Facebook. If you want to join us in the future for the whole conversation, go to creationtoday.org and just become a partner with us. We We'd love for you to do that. Well, Dr. Kendall, look forward to talking to you again on another subject because this everything you talk about is fascinating. Uh, please, guys, get a hold of his DVDs and encourage, use those, invite somebody over to the house, show the DVD, have a conversation, and then apply it to your life. That would be, that would be awesome. Awesome. Well, God bless you guys. Look forward to seeing you next week. Uh, Nate, great to have you here, buddy. I love you, man. I still got to do the last four days of the Grand Canyon with you, okay? Uh, uh, Lisa, thank you for being here. Thanks for commenting. I noticed you commented today, and you don't normally do that. So thanks for commenting. God bless you guys. We'll look forward to seeing you next week.